So the thinkers we were just discussing are, are largely considered philosophical writers or philosophical thinkers, with the exception, I suppose, of Dostoevsky, who's literary, right? What's going on culturally simultaneous to these, um, culturally in terms of like literature, the popular culture that Kierkegaard is deriding in many senses, simultaneous to these more skeptical voices that are pointing to something more fundamental? Mm -hmm. If you think of the 19th century, I'm talking about here the transition from the 19th century to the 20th century. So I'd say roughly the end of the Napoleonic period, let's call it 1815 for the sake of the argument, until the end of the First World War in 1918. And so this is very often in historical terms, this is called the long 19th century, hmm. the long century, whereas the 20th century is the short century from 1918 to 1989, very often people say. And over the course of the long 19th century, you see a series of shifts, the formation of empires arising from the Congress of Vienna, and then their eventual dissolution, dissolution following the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles. So you see this rather slower process of rise and fall taking place geopolitically. Culturally, you have already very early on in Romanticism, but also in realism, in naturalism, you have the emergence of very, what should I say, very acute, very precise, very sharp, very critical writings and perspectives on everyday life. So Charles Baudelaire in, in France is usually considered one of the main representatives here. Edgar Allan Poe in the United States is one. Um, there are many in the, in the course of the 19th century that develop through realism to naturalism, a counter view that's pointing out the actual struggles going on in everyday life in, in the world at the time. And so you have, you have there a general, I should say, tension between what people would like to see happening, what they wish were happening, what they think should be happening, and what is in fact happening on the ground. And in a way, this is very much the tension we see going on today. Yeah, I mean, as you were saying that, it was just, it was impossible not to draw the connection. I mean, yeah. there's there's this tangible sort of techno-optimism that's, you know, epitomized almost to a sort of a caricature degree by Silicon Valley. Exactly. At the same time, you have, you know, clearly unsettling socioeconomic processes it, yeah. it, all over the world, but especially in the West, right, with yeah. respect to North America, Europe. Just mass distress. I mean, this yeah. tremendous flow of refugees and migration now, 65 million people moving across the world looking for a home. So for me, what, what all this means is that existentialism, if, if we take existentialism to mean active concern with the conditions of existence, which is how I understand it, we can see existentialism as more and more pertinent today because people are more and more concerned about how these stories we have, techno-optimism, technological rationality, the notion of progress itself, how these stories are not being realized on the ground in everyday life. They're still out there as some possibility long in the future, but in everyday life, actual everyday life seems to be getting for many, not for all, but for many, more and more stressful, more and more anxious, more and more as Kierkegaard would say, filled with anxiety, distress, and paradox. So more and more of a struggle. And I think this is one reason why I think so many people are interested in existentialism today, because it speaks to these very existential concern. We could even, just today I heard the phrase, a uh, Brexistential crisis about <laughs> yeah. Brexit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. To, for the record, today was the day T T Theresa May just barely survived her no confidence vote with respect to Brexit. So that's a, yeah, that's a very apt term for exactly what we're <laughs> so, all observing. So you see how how much to the point the thinking of the conditions of existence actually is. And in my view, I see this as primarily a positive sign because. When we look at actual conditions of existence, we begin to realize the amount of problems we're facing and we can begin to actually address them and try and confront them rather than wasting time talking about things that are rather remote, idealistic, and mythical, really. What I just said now, this focus on conditions of existence, emerges more and more through the works of Heidegger, Hannah Arendt, 
Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, Franz Fanon, Maurice Meloponti, the 20th century group that I look at, Camus, that I look at in the, in the course on existentialism. They're all really interested in what's going on on the ground, what are the actual conditions in which we live and that we have to confront. And Both on the phenomenological side, like sort of individual subjective experience and on the, and on the social condition side, or yes, more absolutely. one or the other? No, nope, both on both sides. Heidegger most notoriously in Being in Time, taking up many ideas from Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, developed a picture of the human, he called it Dasein, um, that person who is somewhere, the being who is there, he described this um, entity as someone constituted by care, who lives in, in a situation of care. Now, care doesn't mean, in Heidegger's terminology, compassion. The German is Sorge, which means something between fears and anxieties. That's very different <laughs> from very the connotations so we would have. We're filled with concern, we're filled with anxiety, we're filled with distress, we're filled with care in that sense. So it's a degree of emotional investment maybe beyond what we would want to have but are forced to experience. Now, he doesn't describe it that way. That would be a psychological describe, right. description. He calls it ontological. He said this is an ontological constitutive um, situation in which the human being finds itself governed by care. And what he follows from that is, he says, what is part of that is we are not rationally in control of our everyday life. Instead, we are thrown from birth to death and every morning when we wake up, we are thrown into conditions that we have no control over, that we have to respond to, that we have to react to. And he's, his point there is we are governed by moods that drift in and out of our lives. So the, the best example... I These are subjective individual moods or, or sort of the moods of <laughs> society and the conditions that end up pushing us into you know, one context See, you, or another. You, you naturally go to psychological terms. I suppose I do, yeah. yeah. So he, for him, these are not subjective individual moods. These are ontological again. So his point there is we, we consistently find ourselves thrown into moods over which we have no control. We cannot determine where they came from and where they're going. All we can do is respond to them, is react. The moment of waking up in the morning is a, is a classic example. When you wake up in the morning, have you determined in sleep how you wake up and in what mood? No. In his view, you're just there. You're thrown into this setting. Now you have to respond. Now you have to react. In his view, what we do most of the time is we accept stories from others and impose them on ourselves. So we attempt to organize our days, our time, our responses, according to what other people have told us. They could see Kierkegaard in here already, mm -hmm. right? The imposition of others. Heidegger calls it the they, the they self, das Mann. And he says in the extent to which we allow ourselves to be um, determined, shaped, by others, by the they self, we are inauthentic. We live inauthentically. And he says, he puts this in a, in a very dramatic formulation, a single sentence uh, in Being in Time. He says, everyone is the other and no one is themselves. Jeder ist der andere und keiner sich selbst. Meaning, for the most part, we live under the jurisdiction of others, under the motivation, explanation, determination of others. We live inauthentically. Now, he doesn't say it's bad. That's what I was going to ask. So I mean, he's not it... moralizing about it, but it's hmm. clear that he prefers the alternative, which is authentic, authentic living. And authentic living doesn't mean finding that little part of yourself that is really you. So it's not that. He doesn't have the view of the self where there's a core secret self inside that you have to find and bring out. He says the authentic self resists the demands of the others. And he says this is most visible in our relation to death. That most of the time we avoid death, we deny it, we don't want to think about it. That's because we've been told so often, don't think about it. It's morbid, it'll make you unhealthy, it'll make you unhappy. He says when you start to think about death, you really start to think more about yourself. 
Hmm. Because death, he says, is your own most possibility. Your own most possibility. So for him, and his explanation of that is, no one can take your death from you. Your death is only your own. And right. you can't take someone else's death either. So he says it's your own most possibility, your death. So what he wants you to do is develop a more authentic relationship to your own mortality, basically. And to do that, to begin that, resist claims of others about how you should deal with death. Towards the end of being in time, he comes to an amazing formulation that's not recognized enough in research, it seems to me. He says, an authentic relationship to time would be one involved, involved in depresencing the now. He calls it in German, Entgegenwärtigung, depresencing the now. So what that means is you don't see the now moment as simply the present. That is what others tell you to think. Common sense would have it the now moment is the present, and that's fully distinct from the past and the future. What he wants you to see is that the now moment arises from the past heading towards the future and is a kind of uh, the result of a kind of back and forth movement between the past and future, not something that's fully distinct hmm. from the past and future, right? He says the present moment, the now moment, is between, so it's in between. It's, I, I would call it an abyssal present, A-B-Y-S-S-A-L, an mm -hmm. abyssal present. It's in the abyss between the no longer, which is the past, and the not yet, which is the future. So we're in this space between the no longer and the not yet. And it's pretty fraught, it's pretty stricken, but it will be authentically ours if we inhabit that space, if we dwell in that space, if we leave it open for ourselves and resist the claims of others. In other words, if we find our own proper, own most arrangement in that particular moment against what others tell us to do. Does he mean that in terms of how, how it is we choose to act in that moment or how it is we occupy our, our mental life in that moment? Good. So you're, again, what you're doing uh, is you're taking this picture and you're moving in the direction of action and psychological life. And these are consequences. We'll come to that in a minute. But he means it is an actual ontological condition. So he thinks, what he does is he takes temporality, say from Hegel among others, and radicalizes the picture of temporality such that the past is something that's no longer there, but it's still resonating through the present. The future is something that's not yet there, but still shaping the present. And the present is this space, this kind of oscillating space, alternating space, between the no longer and the not yet. So he's arguing that this is simply the, the most correct, or I guess in his terms, authentic way to conceptualize what it is the present is. Mm, what the present does. What it does, okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, what the present does. Now watch the problems arising from this. It's a very powerful view of time, and it's something that is very hard to explain and takes a while to wrap your head around, but students enjoy hearing about it, I enjoy talking about it. It goes against the notion of the present moment as a distinct moment in a sequence of eternal nows, right? This is from Aristotle, that each moment is a now, a now, a now, a now, and that's all we have, eternal nows. Heidegger wants you to see that you're, you're moving back and forth constantly, that you're essentially dispersed, this is his word, seshtoit hmm. in German, dispersed across three different zones, three different temporalities, so that you are never actually at home in any one particular time. He calls this ecstatic temporality, meaning outside the state of any particular time, right? So authentically relating to time means you have to acknowledge this ecstatic temporality, suggesting you're really on your own in developing your own understanding of what's going on for you. You can see it in a way as using, using Hegel mm -hmm. to radicalize Kierkegaard to come up with an ontological picture about being an individual in time. 
This is partially how I describe it. Right, I see, because Kierkegaard's emphasis, again, in response to Hegel was the, the importance of the individual and to some degree the non-rational phenomenological exactly. experience. Exactly. And Heidegger's taking Hegel and then taking Kierkegaard and saying, there's a bit of both. Yeah, there is a <laughs> which, bit of both. Which Hegel would probably nod at and say, well, there you go. That's the <laughs> dialectic <laughs> process. He would, except he wouldn't support this idea of um, the abyss. So the, there is, I have, to, I have to bring this up now, there is in Heidegger's life and work a serious problem arising from this. On the one hand, the picture of ontologies just created in the time is really quite marvelous and quite provocative and leads to a lot of very interesting speculations about what's really going on in time. But on the other hand, because it is primarily ontological, you realize there's no morality involved in it at all. So you get no sense of what you should do right. or what is good to do. It's not a normative description in Heidegger's account. It's not anyways. a normative description. You're wide open. It could literally go either way, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in Heidegger's hands, it became, I believe, the basis for his eventual um, work with the Nazi party. He, following, I believe, his wife's lead. Elfrido was a Nazi before Martin was. I believe that's historically the case. There's some argument about that. He then became the rector of the University of Freiburg under the Nazis in 1933 and gave a horrifying speech in which he said, you know, the real role of the university is to support the Fuhrer and develop the German state. It's quite a horrifying speech. It's really quite amazing. This, this seems to be exactly what Kierkegaard was uh, sort of presaging his anxiety about, right? The way you were describing the way that the state and the church in his case, but I suppose the ideological structure that was present at the time were converging on something, if not totalizing, something that that diminished people's individual responsibility. Absolutely. This is very much a, a living out of, of Kierkegaard's anxiety. On the other hand, Heidegger seems to have felt this was authentically true and the authentic moment for the real movement of the German spirit when it entered the scene in the National Socialist Party. So he was very enthusiastic from about 1933 to 1934 in his public pronouncements. And then in 1934, he withdrew from the position of the rector. He gave up the rectorship after about eight months. We know now from his books, the, the black notebooks and other letters and so on that he wrote, that he was anti-Semitic, that he did support the National Socialist Movement. But we also know that towards the end of the Nazi period in the 40s, he came under uh, Gestapo surveillance and was eventually put on a road crew, right? So we know that he had a very... So the question is, well, what was his real commitment to the Nazi party? It seems that it was quite strong. And how did that actually relate to his philosophy? It seems that it followed from the thought of authenticity to a certain extent. Because so, one can be authentically left or right. Do you understand absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because, because it's open, <laughs> Yes, right? it's open. Yeah, yeah. There's no particular guidance there. But I, I guess one can also think of authenticity then either at the level of the individual or at the level of the collective. And exactly. it seems like Heidegger had made, a, perhaps in his own mind, an authentic decision to, to embrace authenticity at the level of the collective, even if it meant losing oneself in a, in a m movement. He must yes, have made some sort of personal calculus. Back to the devil's thing, yeah. absolutely. And it comes in a way, and you hear this in his speech, the rector's speech, it comes from an old German notion, das Volk, the folk, right? The, the view in English would say the people, mm -hmm. right? That there's an idea that a people has a particular soul or a particular nature. And this soul or nature can best be embodied in a certain national form or a certain state form. And that this soul or nature finds its purest expression in this national form, in this state form. It's a very romantic idea. It goes back. Yeah, to it's the sort of thing now century. people would, would sneer at as uh, the epitome of essentialism, right? They would in say. a way, but they, people would also celebrate. And we see many signs of this today in the revival of what I would call ethno nationalism, where we have the reemergence of national identity, a certain, I would call it imaginary national identity that becomes the basis for a political movement. And you have the revival of these 
these um, fantastic beliefs that the real essence of a nation is A, B, and C, and this, then this becomes enshrined in a political program. We see this in many countries around the world today, and Heidegger seems to have been particularly vulnerable to this. At the same time, his best students, Hannah Arendt, who was also his lover, uh, Hans-Georg Gadamer, who went on to become very famous in hermeneutics, and Herbert Marcuse, who were all his students, were shocked and appalled and horrified that he would make this move. So they didn't see at the this time. At the time, they didn't see this in his actual work. They didn't see this particular thing coming. They all rejected it and dismissed what he was doing. Marcuse left Germany. He was Jewish. He had to get out of Germany. Hannah Arendt left Germany. She was Jewish. Hans Georg Gadamer stayed, and through a variety of ways, was able to actually become a professor of philosophy by the end of the war. But they all turned against this dimension of Heidegger and felt that it went quite against what he'd been doing and writing in the 1920s. So there's, there's, it's become a permanent issue in the reception. How should we understand his turn, it's called, into National Socialism, especially in light of his uh, philosophy. I guess there's a confusion here, of, it sounds like for Heidegger students as well as for the rest of us when we, when we look at people like Heidegger and try to understand what was going through their mind at the time. There's this, there's this blurring between different notions of philosophy. Philosophy as sort of a, an ontological pursuit or a, an epistemological pursuit, you know, trying to understand the nature of the units of reality or the, or, or the nature of experience or knowledge versus moral philosophy, right? Yes. Trying to understand what is what is right, what is the good, yeah. which um, I may have this wrong, but which I sort of associate with the Kantian tradition. Um, Not only Kantian, of course, but tonic, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I guess in just in everyday speech, philosophy kind of takes in, the word philosophy or the associations people have with the term tend to lump all of these together, but in many cases there's no reason to think that one necessarily follows from the other, right? And that Very explains the students, the student, Heidegger students' shock. I mean, is that, is that part Very of the... Very nicely put. I, I agree with that entirely. Hmm. But I, I should warn you, that thought that you just articulated very clearly goes against one of the oldest traditions in, the philosophy, in philosophy and philosophical history in the West, which is an attempt to think all these elements together. Since Plato, part of the aim of philosophy has been to think the true, the good, and the beautiful, so the epistemological, the moral, and the aesthetic together, and to come up with a unifying theory that would combine all these elements and give an account of all these elements. Kant, too, was involved in this in his three critiques, critique of pure reason, practical reason, and judgment. It's Richard Rorty, actually, who says, in his, um, he's got a wonderful essay called Trotsky and the Wild Orchids. He said, he grew up thinking that he could find this unified theory until he was about 15. And then he read Hegel. He At said, the late great age of 15. Really? Well, yeah, he was, he was he in an... university by that age. <laughs> right. So and then he read Hegel and he realized that actually it's possible to think different things separately. It's possible to do philosophy without having a unified theory. And he takes this view, which you just expressed quite clearly, I think, and he then starts looking at different writers like Heidegger. And he says, well, Heidegger was, and this is his phrase, quote, a Schwarzwald Black Forest redneck, unquote. He says, <laughs> okay, Heidegger was a Schwarzwald redneck, likely a fascist, supportive of the Nazi party, but there are some amazing ideas in his work. You shouldn't throw out everything just because of his commitment to the National Socialist Party. And he said, look at Plato, for example. Plato supported a tyrant, two tyrants. We don't throw out everything he did just because of his commitment. So he, he really, and then he went further. He said, look at Nietzsche. Nietzsche had some very questionable passages, but we don't throw out everything he did for these questionable passages. And he said, in fact, we will practice philosophy better if we keep its different elements apart, concentrate on them separately, and then we can do what real philosophy should do. And you can hear in that the faint echo of Hegel in that, right? A dialectic view of philosophy, competing sides that are nevertheless held apart, but in the extent to which you hold them apart, you're doing them together. Hmm. This is what Hegel would say, right? 
And we, we did it, uh, turning to Rorty now, I guess to a degree, did he did he see himself as as actively reflecting Hegelian thought? Or Absolutely, was, he said yeah. reading Hegel and reading Proust; these were the two important turning points in his intellectual life. And then he began as an analytic philosopher, and especially uh, through his dissertation and then in his work at Princeton, he was primarily known as an analytic philosopher, especially in the philosophy of language. But then in the 60s, arising from the cultural situation, his own reading, he began to read Nietzsche, began to read Heidegger, eventually became friends with Derrida, with Gadamer. They began to read Foucault, and he, he realized his insight was to say that the continental tradition at the, at the time and historically actually is doing something quite similar to the analytic tradition, and we should start to see thinkers in both traditions together. And his, his argument was that John Dewey in American Pragmatism, Ludwig Wittgenstein in Analytic, and, and Martin Heidegger were all doing things in parallel ways around the same time. So Dewey, Wittgenstein, and Heidegger needed to be seen together. It's I amazing. Think, I think there's an interesting point just to, uh, it may feel like an aside, but for, again, for our viewers and listeners, as well as for myself, there's, I, for people that have, that have read some philosophy, there's sort of an intuitive dichotomy or just a taken for granted dichotomy between analytic and continental. Um, and, but there must have been some sort of point in Western intellectual history where there was this break between what philosophy, opinions about what philosophy should or should not consist of. And was this, was this after sort of the work of Hegel and, and Heidegger and the like, or was there something happening earlier and or parallel to those processes that ended up creating this sort of dichotomous approach to what philosophy could or should be? That I would say, and we may get some argument on this from the, from the viewers and listeners, I would say that the decisive moment circles around um, Bertram Russell, and Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein writes in his Tractatus a, a document that is quite stunning and quite startling. It's primarily an analysis of language. This became the basis, This Russell took this up along with G. E. Moore, and this became the basis for eventually Russell's history of Western philosophy that became the standard template for looking at the history of Western philosophy from an analytic point of view. So it really is, I would say, around 1910, 1920, mm -hmm. that the split between the analytic and continental traditions really starts to become more explicit. There were roots of this before, but it becomes more and more explicit. And then in the 1930s, with the emergence of a group closely related to parts of Wittgenstein's work called the Vienna Circle, um, Carnap is one of the leaders in this, C-A-R-N-E-P, the movement, the development into uh, the analytic tradition becomes much stronger. And the analytic tradition... Felt, Ironically, beginning with uh, the group in, based in Vienna. so the, a, the, a group that had come from Vienna, so they were from, continental. Right, exactly. But they mostly had to go into exile, right? So most went to Britain or the United States. Right, and that's where the, the and that's where became the notion both geographical the Vienna as circle well as, came from. That's right, right. I so see, yeah. continental analytic philosophy finds is really inaugurated or initiated most prominently by a group called the Vienna Circle. So it's not a geographic designation. It's a, desi it's a dis distinction between different ways of thinking. Uh, the way of thinking that became most prominent in the analytic, the analytic tradition was enshrined by a man named A.J. Ayer, A-Y-E-R, in a book on logical positivism. So logical positivism, especially in the 50s, and probably from the 50s to the 70s, I'd say, became the hallmark of analytic thinking. And Rorty started to react against this by actually going back to John Dewey and working with Dewey as against logical positivism, because Dewey had been very social, very concerned with, very so, very concerned with social questions, very concerned with questions of education and um, pragmatic everyday experiences and already felt these were not getting sufficient attention in uh, analytic philosophy at the time. And if, so what was the nature of the, or the flavor of what Ayer was, was, um, was sort of chiseling out of the body of philosophical work to that point that Rorty ended up reacting against? Okay, Ayer follows, so again, then this is for some of my colleagues in UBC philosophy, so they may take issue with this, but for me, um, Ayer follows, follows Carnap and especially one essay by Carnap 
about sense and nonsense in philosophy is an important sort of turning point in the distinction between the analytic and continental traditions. And what Carnap argues philosophy should do is look at language primarily and look at linguistic utterances that make sense, that are sensible. So you want to, on that basis, you want to discard utterances that have no direct references, talking about God or talking about metaphysical things, metaphysical concerns, but you want to look at, at sentences that are logically consistent and sensible. And he distinguishes that kind of language, that kind of utterance, from what Nietzsche's doing in the first place and mm -hmm. Heidegger's doing most primarily. He takes a special umbrage at one sentence from Heidegger that he wrote after being in time, in the, in the, I believe it's in the um, What is Metaphysics essay. The sentence goes, das nichts nichtet in German. And the English means the nothing nothings. So, pretty cryptic. <laughs> pretty cryptic. <laughs> and Carnap looked at this and said, you see, this is absolute nonsense. It's completely nonsensical. It's not even good poetry. We should just discount this. It's neither philosophy nor poetry. It should be dismissed. Now, what Heidegger actually meant was that the nothing is not empty. It's not a void. That nothingness is active. That it's, there's an abundance there. There's something going on there that is not simply empty, but is actually also productive and generative, as much as the something. So the something and the nothing, in Heidegger's view, are both similarly active and productive. That seems things. reminiscent of what you were just describing about Hegel earlier, exactly. where he was it's very yeah, close to Hegel. seeing the seeds of, of something in its negation. Vice it's very Hegel. close to Hegel. The opening sentences of Hegel's Science of Logic say, being is nothingness. That's almost, you can almost draw a direct line from that to Heidegger's right. claim, the nothing nothings. But for Carnap, it's a completely senseless claim. What are we supposed to do with that? What does that mean? As you said, it's cryptic. And then he turned to Nietzsche and he said, now Nietzsche was a little better because you can kind of make out what he's saying in the genealogy of morals and so on. But Nietzsche is still too poetic. He's primarily poetic, mixed with some philosophy. So we should continue to study Nietzsche a bit, but not Heidegger. And this view that you want to look at sentences that make sense and are logically understandable, continues through logical positivism. The positivist element becomes looking at language that is logically coherent and sensible. And the, the other work that um, appears around the same time as Ayer's on logical positivism is uh, How to Do Things with Words by um, Austin and Searle, a very famous work that looks at different kinds of utterances and how the different kinds of sense they make. Right. So, so this, I'm, cu I'm curious. Is this is this um, just while well, the thought pops into my head and it, it doesn't bubble away? So is this is this a like a a conscious attempt on the part of some philosophers to take philosophy in a direction that would make it more compatible or more reflective of what's happening simultaneous in others in the sciences? In sciences, exactly. Yeah, it's very much linked to scientific developments after the war. It's linked in the first place to a reaction against all the exaggeration, the idealism, the abstractions, the metaphysics of language, writing, and thought up until 1945. So it's an attempt to shrink philosophical concerns to everyday life, everyday language, very practical issues. What do actual sentences actually mean? Was part was part of the motivation for that the 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 cognizance that people like Heidegger actually got caught up in what was absolutely. in retrospect quite Very morally fraught. Very questionable. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. So that's a big part of it, but it's also part of an explicit attempt to link philosophy up with developments in, for example, psychology at the time. For example, this is around the time when behaviorism gets going. B.F. Skinner is very active then and others. Right. Piaget. The notion that what really matters is what people do and what you can observe as opposed to internal states. And exactly, sort of exactly. So, so there's, there's there's very much of a convergence between uh, Piaget, Skinner, um, analytic philosophy at the time. And it's not coincidental merely temporally you're saying there's there's some sort of cross-fertilization there in terms of the, yes. the ideas that are... I think so. Yeah. Sort of 
it's part of a general reaction against the previous period, but it's also part of an attempt to, to um, stabilize the various disciplines, make them more focused, more practical, more um, linked to everyday life, and as a result, make a larger contribution to everyday life, actually. Right. Um, Whereas previously, people, I, I mean, the, the, the writers that we had discussed to this point, the Hegels, the Kierkegaards, the Dostoevskys, they're, they're, they as well are pointing to something that they think is much more profoundly true about everyday life that's being elided by or, exactly. or kind of ignored by. Covered over, yeah, like blocked out. Or covered whatever. over by, yeah. by popular narratives. So uh, there's a similar aim here, but, the, but, but pragmatically or practically, it, it leads in a different direction. Is absolutely, that, absolutely. It okay. leads to everyday utterances. And not to deeper drives or, you know, uh, what should I say, urges or desires. So it's really quite a bit more, I should say it's quite a bit more toned down, quite a bit more, I should say, sober, quite mm -hmm. a bit more somber, but in a way also quite a bit more reductive, um, quite a bit more limited, I would say, and ultimately quite a bit drier actually, mm -hmm. because it leaves out so many parts of everyday life and experience. Indeed. The passions, for example, Kierkegaard again, will to power, for example, you know, sex and death, for example. So you have, at the same time as the analytic tradition is developing in Britain and mm -hmm. the United States, you have the emergence of existentialism, led by Sartre, Beauvoir, Franz Fanon, Merleau-Ponty, saying that actually what Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger were onto was important, but that the moral dimension concern for others needed to be added now and needed to be taken more seriously and promoted more than Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger had done. So what they all did was go back to Hegel hmm. and recuperate Hegel's idea of self-other interactions, dialectic interactions, and argue, following Hegel, that selfhood depends to a considerable extent, not entirely, but to a considerable extent, on relations with others. Uh, in Sartre's case, it leads to um, the beginnings of existential psychoanalysis for him. In Beauvoir's case, it leads to the second sex, the emphasis on gender and what's happening in, in gender relations. In Fanon's case, it leads to the emphasis on what he calls epidermalization or symptoms of racism and colonialism, how they um, relate to selfhood and otherness. And to Merlo, in Merleau-Ponty's case, the phenomenology of perception especially, it leads to understanding the body, embodiment, and how, how we relate to our bodies and how our bodies actually shape to a considerable extent our minds. Merleau-Ponty went so far in 1960, right before he died, he was working on a marvelous essay. It's also rather obscure and hard to read. It's called The Visible and the Invisible, where he argues that the primary part of the human that no one has ever really taken seriously, it needs to be taken seriously now, is actually the skin. That 99.9% .9 of the human is the skin, <laughs> right? And that it's our skin, it's through our skin that we actually interact with the world and others. That we're constantly in a kind of chiasmos, he calls it, a kind of interaction. Uh, through the skin, within the skin, with the air, with um, situations, with other people, right? And so he developed a kind of thinking called fleshism or fleshisme in French, which is quite lovely. <laughs> and unfortunately, he wasn't able to develop this much further. But it has, in recent research in cognitive science and phenomenology, people are looking into this. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, there are certainly echoes of that in, in the embodied cognition. Exactly. Uh, the whole embodied uh, cognition today. movement yeah. follows from that. Per absolutely. Perhaps not its, you know, not, not the, the, the singular focus on the epidermis itself, no. but, but, on, but on, on the way that the, our, our bodily structure actually shapes our ability to come up exactly. with concepts and, and navigate through the world. Exactly. A, you know, a point of view to which I'm very partial as a cognitive anthropologist. Yes. I mean, that it's, it makes very good sense to me. Um, it's so, and it's interesting to note that this actually, the seeds of this were 
if not were planted, you know, started to, to, there were signs of this sort of thinking relatively early on in the 20th century. Yeah, then. absolutely. Right at the end of the war in Merleau-Ponty's first major book, Phenomenology of Perception, and then just before he died, Invisible and Invisible. I'd like to, I, I'd like to come back to the question of modernism, though. Yeah. As against postmodernism. Postmodernism, absolutely. I, and I, yeah, set this in up now in relation to this overarching discussion of modernity. It seems to me we're still very much in the age of modernity, in the age of the modern. If we understand modernity as an emphasis on science, technological rationality, business, capitalism, right? Various forms of mm, cultural emphasis that really do govern our time today. So the modern, the scientific, the rational, the technological are still dominant forms. UBC is governed by these uh, agendas, I think. Humanities are important, but not quite as important as the sciences there. Um, at the same time, though, after the war, after 1945 and increasingly through the 70s, especially in the period from 1968 to 1980, people started responding against the claims of Marxism, the claims of universal religions, the claims of a universal state, and acknowledge, they started to, to move into a phase that Jean-François Lyotard called incredulity towards meta-narratives, mm -hmm. a phase of suspicion towards any grander story or any larger story about what's going on in the world, right? You remember we were talking about that a little bit ago. Does philosophy have to encompass all of truth, goodness, and beauty? And we both were on the side of saying, it. well, it needn't. Right. This is yeah. a very postmodern view, it turns hmm. out, because this exemplifies a kind of suspicion towards meta-narratives, which Leotard wrote in 1979 in his book on the postmodern condition, was typical for postmodernism. This skepticism about grander narratives, in, on hindsight, in my view, actually begins more prominently in already in the late 1940s, where people were concerned about the atom bomb and concerned about the concentration camps and developed a concern about science and technology arising from that, that it might not be as utopian as it might look. The techno-utopian optimism might not be entirely right. right. Sort of a skepticism towards the the inherent goodness of progress and of scientific exactly. advance. Time, yeah. technological rationality. And this intensified in the post-war period from 1945 through 1968, the rebellions in the 60s against older generations and older ways of thinking into the 1980s. Lyotard's book appears in 1979 where he says, the postmodern condition, he seems to celebrate the postmodern condition, involves this suspicion towards meta narratives. Habermas, Jurgen Habermas from the Frankfurt School, writes in response the next year, he gives a lecture in which he says, Okay, I understand this movement of suspicion towards meta narratives, but there's one meta narrative we shouldn't give up on, and that's the very meta narrative of modernity itself. So he goes back to the Enlightenment, he goes back to Kant, and he says there's an incomplete project of modernity that we need to focus on. Instead of throwing it all out, the way many critics seem to suggest we should, he says we need to complete the positive sides, the progressive sides that were there all along since Kant, since the Enlightenment, and have not yet been fulfilled. And this is modernity, not modernism, this right? This is modernity. Right? So what you have in this moment between Lyotard and Habermas, you have a rejection of modernism and a rejection of modernity, this is Lyotard's view, in the direction of smaller narratives, um, local narratives as against global narratives. And from Habermas's Habermas view, you have the return to the overarching view of modernity, emphasizing the many good ideas that were there already at the time, that could be recovered and still needed to be completed. So Habermas is trying to, in a sense, either preserve or resurrect the, the normatively positive aspects of what it was that led us to the point that so many people were shocked by by the end of the World War II? Is exactly. That? that was essentially his argument. And 
Rorty, writing in 1984, writing in response to both of them, said, well, let's split the difference. <laughs> he said, let's follow what Habermas is saying for public discourse, for public use in the public realm, because there are many projects we still do need to complete, like overcoming racism and sexism and classism and ageism. But we can follow what Leotard says um, in private, and maintain our own local narratives and develop them for ourselves, maybe with a few friends, as against what we do in public. So he took this split between the two positions and mapped them onto a split between the private and the public that became in the 80s really um, very controversial and something that he had to debate and argue for and refine until he eventually died. And, um, 2007. So. so just to interject with an idea that popped into my head as you were saying that um, in the meantime, who's to say, kind of as an echo of what we were saying earlier, but who's to say that in the, in the resurrection of the preservation of what was good, quote unquote, about modernity, that it would lead you in the direction of, let's say, reducing classism, reducing racism, you know, promoting social justice, that sort of thing. Who, Who's to say that those are the that those are the inherently good values about modernity? I mean, I, good. you know, as members of a multicultural Western civilization, I may feel that my myself personally, but who's but why wouldn't maybe in other civilizations they wouldn't be the important values? Yeah, or people here in our civilization who happen Two. to be on the other side of a, of a given political divide example, might feel completely yeah. differently. So, Absolutely. so who's to say that it would lead in one way or in one direction or the other? Or is it simply a call to? to re-engage with the normative that... Uh, it's that in the first place, absolutely. This is primarily Habermas's position. So re-engage with the normative. But it's also the view that what he calls um, communicative action can lead to consensus based on rational agreement. This is his view. So in his view, if there's an open discussion with informed people in the public sphere, and they really seek to communicate with each other, and they really seek to find out what are the consequences of their communication, they will come to a consensus, and it will lead in this progressive direction he imagines. Now, mm. what is Which is sort of the role that Hegel saw for philosophy in a way, right? Very in nice, the sense, it, the idea of using, car Very carving much. out new ideas with the language that we have. Very much. Right. But there's another way in which this is very German, and you can understand a little bit where Habermas is coming from if you, if you remember that it is a very German sort of position. And that is, they have seen what happens in Germany when a single individual, Hitler, gets a grasp of a very powerful national myth against reason and against consensus and against communicative action right. and imposes this myth on his people and on others and leading to the deaths and you know 50 million deaths and, and massive destruction worldwide. So Habermas is using this idea of a rationalized communicative discussion leading to consensus to fend off the possibility that someone could get a hold of a powerful national myth and impose that against the group against a collective, against the world in this case, right? Right. And in, in Germany, Habermas has said this repeatedly, in Germany, the need to complete the project of modernity is more urgent than ever. Hmm. Because if not, you're left to default back to what you had previously... If not, you're left to default back to the use of myth, the use of irrational symbols, the use of um, completely anachronistic ways of thinking, to create solidarities that are fantastic, potentially quite destructive, and could lead to further turmoil. So hmm. there's a there's an interesting and important urgency in Habermas's view, I think. Right. Yeah, in the European context that really gets European crystallized. Context, it's yeah. pretty and especially today, especially with the emergence, the reemergence re of what I'm calling ethno nationalism, it's important to consider that, well, maybe some level of communicative action leading to consensus through rational agreement would actually be preferable to the reemergence of an ethno-nationalism. And, and Habermas today is still very, very much engaged as a public intellectual trying to lead this discussion and motivate this, this kind of interaction. So. On that point, this is again kind of an aside, but on that point, I mean, I, I was just 
thinking how you could take that argument and use it to argue either side of the Euro skepticism debate, right? You could say that there's, there's something, I mean, there's some, something inherently uh, di dialogical and, um, and rational about having sort of a European community and with European Parliament in which these ideas are discussed and, and um, debated in a, in a you know, regimented political way on a continental plane, which is positive, you know, the alternative being some war, whether it be economic or physical, yes. right? But at the same time, you could argue that, um, or those on the other side of the, uh, on the Eurosceptic side of the debate could say that by this, this overarching, this growing bureaucracy and this, this class of technocrats is preventing us from doing precisely what, what Habermas is saying needs to happen, which is a, a genuine dialogue yeah. of Good. people Good. actually... Good. It could be interpreted either way. Either way, but, yeah. But I think the, the, the core of what he's trying to get at is um, a more international view as against the national view. So yeah, that would, that, Habermas that would is very follow, much from, of an internationalist and very yeah. much supporting the EU and ultimately the United Nations and very much resisting the um, tendency to, what should I say, re-inaugurate mm -hmm. national distinctions. But you're absolutely right. From a Eurosceptical point of view, the technocracy that we find, the kind of plutocracy that we find in the European Parliament, does come to seem very negative, as if it's blocking real discussion of these issues. And again today, or yesterday, with the vote on Brexit that Theresa May's government lost, uh, we see the, the, um, the urgency I think of these issues. Yeah, the, the not only there, but even in France, right? If you look, I mean, at the time we're filming, there, there, there was still like the, the tail end of this yellow vest movement. Yeah, it, it seems like people are frustrated because they precisely don't have that voice in yes. the process. In Germany, with the uh, AFD movement, the Alternative for Deutschland, and in Italy with Salvini, in Hungary with uh, Orban, in Poland, in so many areas across Europe, this tension between a kind of internationalism and a kind of nationalism is, is getting uh, revivified, is becoming more and more urgent and more and more dramatic, I would say. And it's not clear as yet how it will, will go over time. It's not clear which way these different... In other words, it's not clear... I would put it this way, coming from literature, it's not clear which, it's not clear which story will be more... Uh, widely accepted yet. Right, yeah. So, I mean, if, if, if it's a question of which speaks to people's motivating passions more, um, the writing may, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side you fall, be on the wall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Because Could there's well some. Be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, which just points to the relevance of all this stuff and the fact, and once again, I mean, it sort of brings, in my mind, it brings us full circle back to the point that a lot of what's happening and a lot of what we're observing in, in you know, at this very moment in political life in the West is, if not a reiteration, at least a sort of a, a recent echo of all these issues that were, that came to the fore in the, in the beginning of the modern era. Absolutely. With all these no things you described. Yeah. I think there's no question about that. So for people trying to make sense of what it is that they're viewing today in the news, trying to make sense of their political landscape and then, you know, their, their social media feeds and all this stuff, um, and maybe who have a curiosity for the sorts of ideas and thinkers we were discussing, but don't necessarily know where to turn or or you know how to how to make sense of it beyond you know the occasional YouTube explanatory YouTube video. I mean, what's the value in engaging seriously with these with these what today are older thinkers um, for understanding the you know the conundrums of modern day life? Do you have a do absolutely? And this is something I argue all the time in my classes, and that is first of all that what we see around us as given, what we take to be fixed and potentially static, is not at all that it's arisen historically, that what we see around us now as the present, this is Heidegger potentially, is actually something that comes from a past and is moving towards a future. And so if we see it as a volatile moment with sources from far away and long ago heading towards an equally volatile moment with yet uncertain outcomes, we need to realize that there are many, many different ways of looking what's, at what's going on in the moment. And there are many ways that are directly relevant to understanding what's going on in the moment. So it's a way of introducing people to alternative vocabularies so they can think more fully for themselves. 
and articulate more clearly for themselves how they see what's going on in the moment, where it comes from, and where it may be headed. You see? So it's, and, and I too am a, a member of the Enlightenment to that extent, where I think with a certain awareness of the variety of discourses, variety of positions, variety of analyses and critiques, people can make more or less informed decisions about how to understand their own time and what are the likely consequences of that. So I see, in other words, in some, I see a major role for education in the first place, in this moment especially, and especially for philosophy, because there are, in the history of Western philosophy, but not just Western philosophy, also in the writings of Confucius, Lao Tzu, many different forms of, in uh, the writings of uh, Rumi, uh, the Persian poet, or even Omar Khayyam, for example, other traditions, there are many alternative visions, alternative understandings, alternative vocabularies available that can help people to make sense of what's going on and think about where it might be headed, where it came from and where it might be headed. I think a, a more informed, more rig rigorously studied and applied view of intellectual history, East and West, would create a much more active uh, citizens, citizenry, and much more involved citizenry, people who felt they could actually grasp the complexities of what's going on instead of simply giving up. The attitude that I'm most concerned about is an attitude I often find among students today arising from anxiety, and that is one of simple uh, despair, simply giving things up, being burnt out. The, res the whatever response, I would call it. I, I find many people in the last 10 years take the position, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever I do, it doesn't matter. Just let it go, not be concerned. And I'm, more, I'm much more on the other, in the other direction, that actually what's going on now is of very urgent importance for all of us, for the planet, for our existence, and that an informed view of these different traditions and these different positions can help us understand it and come up with alternatives moving forward. So it sounds like you, you, you're placing a, a particular value on the on the pluralism of, of vocabularies or the pluralism of lexicons that people can develop or at least become aware of by yes. exposing themselves to thinkers that may have come before us. Yes. Right, which, which is, in your mind, is that sort of an antidote to the, to the echo chamber of ideology that seems to be being ramped up by social media and, and Absolutely, and it's, a, it's a major right antidote. If, if, and I think of it, uh, here I have to reveal myself as at least in part uh, pragmatist, you give people a toolbox. When you give them vocabularies and different positions, different alternative views, you give them a toolbox with which to tinker around in the present and have a look at the present for themselves and come up with very often a mix of different tools, different vocabularies, to articulate alternative futures for themselves. I'm not saying one particular way is the right way or the necessary way. I'm, I really believe, here I'm in agreement with Habermas, that if people are sufficiently informed or sufficiently engaged, there will be uh, responses emerging that will lead to alternative futures, will not necessarily lead in one direction or another, and, and could be potentially very progressive. I think even at this time, in 2019, a time where crises seem to be multiplying around us all the time, there are enormous alternatives available. Think of all the movements of resistance we have now. Uh, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, I Don't Know More, the Occupy movement. These are all resistance movements against a certain kind of mainstream thinking. Even Trumpism can be seen as a kind of resistance exactly. movement. Exactly. Yeah, against, it cuts both ways. Against the kind of thinking yeah. that, that many people felt was just too restrictive and too limiting. And so I think this um, volatility, I would say, in the situation today has, has, has many dangers, but also many possibilities that an understanding of uh, previous positions and previous experiences would, would heighten, would highlight, and could potentially lead to alternative um, responses. So at the very pragmatic level, just to wrap up with this, if someone has been watching or listening to this and they're, they're, they're curious, that they're, yes, that sounds good, I want to have more tools in my toolbox, so to speak, to make sense of what it is that I'm experiencing so that I don't end up in this sort of pit of social media despair. Um, what would you point to? What would, let's say, be your top three picks 
uh, today in this moment, not necessarily, you know, uh, for all time, but in, in terms of in text, terms of, in terms of text that people could could turn towards, or at least, or even if they were to look at the Wikipedia page on a particular thinker, you know, or or a particular piece that came out, was there any, anything that you think is particularly appropriate to the time and place? Yeah, um, there are many there are many works that are very appropriate to uh, the time and place, and so I'll I'll, go, I'll start with the one that I mentioned before. This is Rorty, Richard Rorty, R O R T Y, on uh, his. It's a really a autobiographical essay about himself that is a comment on philosophy. It's called Trotsky and the Wild Orchids. It's very accessible. It's written in a very almost folksy way, and it makes a very profound point. The, the point that we were making, you and I, that philosophy needn't be a unified theory encompassing everything. Right. Right. Trotsky and the Wild Orchids. Trotsky and the Wild Orchids. The, the title is quite compelling, I've got to yeah. say that. So. Against that, or together with that, I would recommend what for me is probably my favorite dialogue by Plato, called The Symposium. So now we're going back a few thousand years. Quite a few yeah. thousand years, but The Symposium is, is on love. On love, okay. What is the definition of love? That's the question. It's an evening gathering, all men. They've been drinking, and several of them talk about love. What is love? How do we understand love? Socrates gives a very powerful definition of it towards the end, and then his definition is refuted by one of his former lovers. So it ends up quite unsettled, but nevertheless very provocative and very, I would say, insightful into thinking about love, and along with love, friendship, and different kinds of education. So That's the Symposium on Love. That's the Symposium. The no, it's just called the Symposium. The Symposium. And it deals with love. It's also a educational form, a symposium, right. right? So I'd start with Rorty, it's very accessible. I'd go to Plato, sim the symposium, it's very profound and very forward thinking. And then, those, so that sort of brackets um, Western intellectual history, I think. And then it, it really depends on the way the reader responds to these different issues. It depends on what um, the reader takes to be most significant. For me, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to Mr. Heidegger now, as, as controversial and as problematic as he was. But he had an amazing essay in the 1950s about technology that for me really speaks to the, the role of technology in our lives today. And, and neither Rorty nor Plato actually really talk about technology very much. So Heidegger would be an important addition to the discussion. And the essay is called The Question Concerning Technology. Okay, easy enough to remember. Yeah. And he says there, technology itself is nothing technological. Reminiscent of that sentence that I'll get wrong in German, but the one that you mentioned earlier about <laughs> nothingness and the nothingness, is exactly. that? Exactly. Technology is nothing technological. Technology is a way of revealing. In its way of revealing, modern technology calls us to stand ready, challenges us to be prepared, challenges us to take an aggressive, dominating attitude towards objects, the environment, and each other. He mm. says this is the great danger of modern technology. It's, it's a very short but very concise and very, I think, illuminating description of what modern technology can do. He doesn't mean computers. He means the hydroelectric dam, that's what he's talking about. Sputnik, that's what he's talking about. Um, but then he says, at the same time, technology is highly ambiguous. It's very dangerous because of what it calls upon us to do, how it calls upon us to respond. But it also has what he calls the saving power. Technology can be something very productive, very generative, very creative, if we see it as something poetic, namely something that we create and that we create out of, we create along with, like that, right? So he ends up emphasizing the creativity um, as a potential of technology. It's not entirely negative on technology. It's, it's rather very ambivalent, I would say. So those are the three works I'd recommend. Trotsky and the Wild Orchids by Rorty. It's about 15 pages. Heidegger, The Question Concerning Technology. This is also about 20 pages. 
and Plato's Symposium, which is longer, but but very moving, very beautiful, and uh, I believe will change the reader's views of love to some extent. Wonderful. That's a perfect point to end on. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you.